my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped millions of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps, maternity compression, and lactation education and support. They take care of everything, including all paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. All you have to do is go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Extra bonus, if you use the coupon code TBH15 in their online shop, you'll get 15% off all supplies and accessories. Head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Megan all about her experience using Aeroflow breast pumps to get her breast pump for free through insurance. I'd love to take a minute to tell you about our online childbirth course called Know Your Options. This course takes you from the final weeks of pregnancy all the way through preparing for birth and postpartum, as well as a bonus course all about pumping, storing milk, and preparing to go back to paid work if that's part of your plan. You can see all the different modules laid out for you and more information at thebirthhour.com slash course. When you sign up for the Know Your Options course, you get lifetime access and instant access. So you can work at your own pace and we would love to have you join the private Facebook group for that course as well as our bi-weekly Zoom calls. So again, head over to thebirthhour.com slash course to get all of the info and use the coupon code 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. We'd also love to tell any new listeners who haven't heard that we have a Patreon group. You can head over to patreon.com slash birth hour to see all the information there about how to support the podcast and in return get fun perks and bonuses such as access to our archived episodes and our private Facebook group for our Patreon members. So again, that's patreon.com slash birth hour. Today's birth story guest is Lily, and she's going to talk a lot about different things that came up for her during pregnancy, as well as sharing her hospital induction birth story. Lily was also a student of our Know Your Options online birth course, so you'll hear her talk a little bit about that as well. All right, let's hear from Lily. Hi, Lily. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Hi, I'm so excited to get to talk with you. Yeah, I'm excited to talk to you. All right, before <laughs> we get to your story, can you tell us there's a little bit about you and your family? Sure. So my name's Lily Scott. My husband's Ryan, and we had a baby a month ago. Her name's Waverly. Uh, we live in Washington, D.C., and I am an ex-lawyer lobbyist who quit during COVID, actually, to follow my passion of fitness. While I was a lawyer, lobbyist, I also worked at Core Power and Equinox, um, and I started my own business while I was a lawyer, lobbyist during the lockdown, and then I got to quit, which is amazing. So now I have a fitness app. I'm a content creator on Instagram and TikTok, and I'm a mom, and it's just the thrill of a lifetime to get to sit down and talk to you, Bryn, and give back to this community because I learned and grew so much from listening to episodes while I was pregnant. So I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. I love hearing <laughs> about people finding their their new career path or passion. All right, so let's go back to finding out you were pregnant and what that was like. Okay, so we conceived our beautiful little baby in August of last summer. We were really drunk and having the time of our lives in Nantucket. <laughs> And um, we were with friends. And at the time, we weren't necessarily in like the really trying to conceive phase. We were just sort of seeing what happens. I'm a fitness instructor. So my body and the ability to move around is something that I like cherish. So I wasn't necessarily like trying really hard to get pregnant, but we just wanted to see what happened. And that beautiful night in August, 
we made our baby. And I found out in September, right away, I could just tell something was different. I took a pregnancy test and I remember standing in the bathroom with my husband and we had a digital test and we were just waiting for those dots to change to our answer. And then we found out I was pregnant and went to the beach and just tried to take a breath and um, recognize that like everything's about to change. And it was scary at first, which I can explain a little more, I think, throughout the story, but we were really excited too. All right. So yeah, let's hear about, <laughs> um, now you've, you've laid this little Easter egg here. <laughs> um, let's hear more about pregnancy and how you felt as far as emotionally and physically. Yeah. So at the start of my pregnancy, there is definitely a huge amount of fear. Mm. In May of last year, one of my friends passed away about three days after she had her third baby. Mm, And um, it was from complications. And it just made me understand the gravity of pregnancy. And, you know, we listen to these podcasts and we hear all these stories of women who made it out on the other end. And, and, you know, I had that fear, which I'm not trying to instill into any listener, but I think there are a lot of women who have experiences like that, who have seen, you know, a birth go really, really wrong. And it was a really scary place for me because I didn't know what was going to happen. And I truly just lived through and was still living through the grieving process of a friend who, you know, didn't make it and who left her babies behind. So it was really scary, Bryn. It was like, talk to your therapist, catch a breath and try Mm -hmm. to just like recognize, you know, it usually doesn't end that way. And it's usually not like that. There's a reason why those stories are so heartbreaking, but it was a reality that I, I just saw, like I was just front seat too. So at first I was really scared. Yeah. And I don't know if a lot of people really talk about just the fear of like what could happen. And that was me. Yeah. I think for a lot of people that comes from having their own experience of a loss or something like that, that just kind of adds so much anxiety to the pregnancy and fear, but it's definitely just as much of a thing when it happens to someone close to you. And I can relate to that as well. And it's amazing how much like someone else's experience can affect your own. And with it being your first baby, I could see that being really hard, kind of taking away that innocence of the first pregnancy and and just knowing everything that could happen. Absolutely. Definitely. I like how you say innocence because, you know, I remember seeing so many people sharing their excitement and their glee. And of course that was there. And I also had this just like true fear. And Mm -hmm. luckily throughout the pregnancy process, I was able to really help myself through that fear and get to a place of of strength and like power. But it definitely started out (laughs) with fear. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I, if anyone else is experiencing that right now, I feel for you. So it started scared. Uh, mostly and a little bit panicked because here I am a fitness instructor and I have no idea how long I'll be able to teach and do my passion and make my money. Not only that, but I'm the first of my close friend group to be pregnant. So I kind of felt a little isolated, like who's going to be my go-to person. Who's going to get me? At the beginning, it was a little bit of a victim standpoint, a little bit of a fearful standpoint. So I'm very much a person who just looks at an issue and is like, all right, how am I active for myself? How am I going to be my own advocate? So number one was hiring a doula and um, she was incredible. I truly hired her at like five weeks pregnant. <laughs> like, I need you right now. That's smart though. The, <laughs> the good ones go fast. <laughs> Truly. And she is, she's an amazing one. Her name's Caitlin Wozniak. She's here in DC. She also does personal training for people who are pregnant and postpartum. So I knew I wanted to incorporate that physical aspect with the mental support. So she was incredible. Helped me right off the bat. And yeah, at the first trimester, I think a lot of people say it, but um, I too was very sick. I honestly hated it. I was so stressed out. I had so much anxiety, constantly nauseous. I lost 15 pounds. I was really tired. Like you could not drag me out of bed some days. And it was really hard to show up for teaching my classes. 
uh, for fitness. My husband's a very private person, which is hilarious because I mean, I will tell anyone anything about myself who wants to know. So we had this sort of give and take and he really wanted me to wait until 12 weeks to share that I was pregnant with the world with a social media presence that I have. Like it truly would have been like my greater world of people. He really wanted me to wait. He was like, you never know what if something happened. So that was kind of hard for me because I definitely lean on a lot of people for support and I like to talk through what's going on. But I wanted to honor his experience as well. And I understood where he was coming from. So <laughs> I started making videos on TikTok, but I didn't post them until the 12 week mark of how I felt being pregnant. And um, I made a little series that was pretty funny, just like trying to make light of the situation, but also share and create a community of my own. So I was creating TikToks, throwing up, teaching fitness, and very scared. But um, by the time about like maybe the 16th week of pregnancy, I was feeling a little bit better. Uh, during that time, I also turned 30 years old and I had planned this incredible like over the top birthday party, like a big party house with 30 of my friends. And I had to cancel it, which was a bummer because I just I didn't feel like I was in the right space being pregnant. Um, so my husband took me to Vegas, <laughs> which I don't know. I'm not sure if that was the best place to go while I was pregnant. I could have gone for like a spa trip or something, but we went to Vegas. And then when I got home, I wasn't feeling too great. And then there was a little bit of spotting. Talked to my doula and my doctor. They had me go in for an appointment. It turned out I had a low-lying placenta, so they wanted to be pretty careful with me. It was pretty close to placenta previa, which could have resulted in me being on bed rest. So they wanted me to stop exercising altogether, or at least the doctor who I talked to at that point did. Stopping exercising was pretty devastating for me just because it was you know, my, my whole business. So that was probably when I went from the scared part of pregnancy to in the middle, the frustrated part of pregnancy, where I just was sick of it. And I think a lot of people get there, like in the middle point, whether you're actually like physically sick or throwing up or what, or you have issues or not. I think there's this part in the middle where you're like, oh my God, I have to do this for 20 more weeks. How? Honestly, how? <laughs> so that's where I was. <laughs> it wasn't pretty. But, you know, I got through it. I shut down my business and then I had a lot of time to think. And when you're pregnant and a lot of things are stripped away from your being and like what you used to be able to do, I was forced to see like, who am I really? Who am I without fitness? Who am I without going out with friends and being as social as I used to be? Like, who truly am I? So I took that hard moment as a time to just like reflect and understand who I am before, you know, a huge life change. So that happened. And then as we went forward, my baby was breached like the entire pregnancy. And as we got into you know, week 30, it started to be a little bit more of a, oh, okay, the baby's still breech moment. And I was told like so many people, I'm sure, to start doing the spinning babies exercises. So here I am in the living room, upside down, doing all these crazy inversions, trying to flip my baby. And um, as I'm doing these inversions and worried about breach, my husband and I had to move. We're still in D.C., but the house that we were in or the condo we were in before was a fourth floor walk up, which I just had no appetite for doing. At the end of my pregnancy, I was like, there's no way we can stay here. And I definitely did not want to carry a baby up four flights of stairs once that came. So we started aggressively looking for a house. It was like the worst time to buy a house in D.C. The market was crazy. It was super competitive. And that was anxiety, too. But we finally found a place. I was at 32 or 3, maybe 34 weeks when we were able to move to the house that we found here in DC, which is amazing. We were so lucky. I felt relieved right off the bat. Um, and then the big issue was trying to flip this baby. I really, really wanted to have a vaginal delivery. I really wanted to do this birth without pain medication, 
with as little intervention as possible. Given the experience of my friend who passed away, I really wanted to work with my body and honor it. So we really wanted to just get this baby flipped. (laughs) I was like, number one, I woke up. I'm like, how do I flip this baby? Um, Every single day, I was just like, how do I flip her? I eventually went to a chiropractor at 34 weeks pregnant in sort of desperation to help her flip because she just hadn't yet. And when I went to the chiropractor who specializes in um, flipping babies, my first appointment resulted in me fainting at the place, which apparently never really happened. Like he said, it happened twice in his 30 years of practice. So I'm like, what's going on? I also peed myself during that appointment, like when I fainted. So I was like, oh my gosh. I think that probably was my rock bottom, oh. which, <laughs> which I was like, you know, I, the way I feel about life is if you're going to laugh about it later, laugh about it now. I was okay. I talked to my doctor, allowed myself to laugh about it, called all my friends, told them I peed myself. And I was like, this pregnancy is not the magic that you see on TV. So <laughs> peeing yourself is super normal when you pass out because everything just relaxes. Everything relaxes which maybe my body needed because I was so high stress. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so that was interesting. The chiropractor was really nice and honestly acted like I didn't pee myself, which I think is the way to go. It was great. So I went to see him twice, which good for me for showing back up to that place. I was proud of myself. I was just thinking that, but I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to show my face. She went back. <laughs> and I, I just acted cool about it. Yeah. He was so nice. Love it. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> when I went the first time, I wasn't wearing underwear, which is like maybe TMI, but I just was like, I don't know. I was just wearing like leggings and a shirt. So the next time I went, I was like very clothed. I was like, like, there should be layers. There should be things just in case. <laughs> anyway, did not pee the second time, did not faint the second time, and the baby flipped. That's the moral of the story, people. Baby flipped. I was so excited. Right before I found out she flipped, we were driving to get the ultrasound. I was like the last one before birth. And I just remember crying in the car to my husband saying, I feel like it's my fault when your babies breach, there are so many articles saying, well, if you've been sitting, if you've been doing this, even with spinning babies, there's a little bit of, well, like, you know, lifestyle makes it so your babies breach. And it just felt like it was my fault. Like I was doing this to this poor little innocent little baby and to myself. And he just said, you know, it's, it's not your fault. The baby is the way it is. Like your uterus is shaped the way it's shaped. Like your body is what it is and you've done everything you can. So let's just see what happens. But there's no reason why you should think it's your fault, which ugh, I loved hearing it. So if anyone else is experiencing anything with their pregnancy, just know it's not your fault. So that was nice. And then we, we saw that she was flipped and it was a really relieving moment. In the last trimester, after this baby flipped, you'd think, okay, that's enough. She's good. But (laughs) then I started having high blood pressure, which was scary. And hilariously enough, I was determined for this baby to be a Gemini. And she was on the cusp. Like, she's supposed to be a Gemini. Like, her due date was Gemini season. But she could be Taurus if anything went wrong or she had to be induced or whatever. So... We were on the cusp, and this is no offense to Tauruses. It's just, you know, I'm a Sagittarius, husband's a Gemini. We looked up the charts, and apparently Geminis are more compatible for us. So I was trying to hold out to at least May 20th, which, you know, was a sort of bump when it came to having hypertension and high blood pressure because it's a serious issue. Throughout the pregnancy, I felt as though my, like, eyes were sort of going to pop out of my head. Kind of like, you know, the toys growing up where like it's like a cow and you squeeze it and the eyes pop out. I kind of felt like that (laughs) sometimes. Like I felt like someone was squeezing me. So much pressure. Yeah. And it was really weird. And here I am trying to stay moving as much as I could. And in the last trimester, you know, I'm feeling that squeezed feeling. I'm getting very, very swollen to the point where if I went on a long walk or if I 
if I was on my feet for any point in time. It wasn't just like, oh, I can't see my ankles anymore. It was actually like there is true pain in my legs. Like I am truly in pain and uncomfortable. And I didn't know that that was a sign of having high blood pressure. I didn't know that that was something I was supposed to express to my doctor in an urgent way. And um, it was only after they saw, you know, my blood pressure is really high that um, they let me know, hey, if you start to feel painfully swollen, you got to call us, which I wish I'd known sooner because they probably would have put me on medication had we like picked up on that sooner. But here I am massive at this point. I ended up gaining 60 pounds throughout the process. And half of that weight was in that last trimester. And I was just so, I was just like swelling everywhere. Nothing fit. I felt so uncomfortable, which so many women feel uncomfortable in their last trimester. And I was totally in those weeds with them. So that was tough. Because of the high blood pressure, my doctor sent me to the hospital at 37 weeks. She thought for sure I was getting induced at that 37-week point. But my blood pressure, for whatever reason, had lowered by the time I got to the hospital. So my husband and I sort of just looked at it as like a test run. We hadn't had our bags packed. So I called him out of work and I'm like, meet me. The doctor wants me to go to the hospital. We rushed and packed up everything and got there. And we were discharged after about seven hours of sitting in uh, labor and delivery on some monitors. But luckily, I thought that was like a nice experience. Obviously, like not ideal, but I was able to see just how nice the nurses were. I had a little bit of fear of doing an at-home birth or a birth anywhere other than the hospital, given you know the situation with my friend. So I, I knew that, that going to the hospital was going to be the right choice for me. And I went to Sibley Hospital, which is close to where I live and has such a good reputation here in DC. They did not disappoint. Even in that test run, the nurses were truly incredible, just fantastic women who took the best care of me, who helped answer questions. And I felt really, really safe. They also were very interested in knowing what my birth preferences were, if I had anything written out, which I really appreciated because I think sometimes hospitals get a bad rap for that. And at least in my experience at Sibley Hospital, that was absolutely not the case. So I got sent home. And then it was sort of a game of chicken brand where I'm just trying my hardest <laughs> to hold this baby in until May 20th so she can be a Gemini, which in retrospect was so dumb. But there I was and I knew my blood pressure was high. They gave me a certain like threshold to call the, the doctor if my blood pressure hit a certain point. At that point, I had like a monitor at home and I was supposed to be checking my blood pressure three times a day. And it was like, it was at the threshold and I was just like not calling. And I'd call my doula and she's like, what are you doing? But I just, it didn't feel right. I didn't want to get induced. I wanted to have this baby like unmedicated as possible, as like little intervention as possible. So as I'm waiting it out, um, I'm doing a lot of education and I'm learning as much as humanly possible about birth, about all the ways to have labor, all the ways to get through it. And um, I took a stork class, which is like in person here in DC. It was run by some nurses and I really didn't feel like they were teaching us all the options. I felt like they were sort of romanticizing the epidural, romanticizing like a pain-free, like uneducated process. And I just wanted to know everything about birth. So luckily at that point, like in my third trimester, I'd already been addicted to this podcast. <laughs> uh, and I had listened to you tell about your course, mm -hmm. um, the Know Your Options course. And there was a sale going on at the time. And I was like, you know what, this is my sign. And I signed up for the Know Your Options course. And I just remember sitting outside and taking these classes and, and you know going through the modules and feeling so much better about about the process here i was so fearful for so long and then i do these modules and i'm like you know what this helped me so much i just wanted to know that i was that i had control of the situation that i wasn't just like going to show up willy-nilly without any idea of what was going on so by the time i finished the modules 
I just felt like, okay, I'm not afraid. Like I'm not afraid of birth anymore. I know that what's going to happen is going to happen. And like, sometimes things don't go the way you want them to, but I know all these different options. And I know that I know as much as I possibly could. Like by the end of it, I felt like when I was about to take the bar, like I felt prepared. I knew as much as I could and I just had to go in trusting myself. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That makes me so happy. That's like the greatest compliment. (laughs) Birth prep, bar prep. It was like bar prep. Yes. That's amazing, especially considering how fearful you had been. I was taking like all these notes, (laughs) literally. My only thing is I wish I had signed up for Know Your Options sooner. I wish I had taken those modules sooner because that like the fear and anxiety, especially toward birth is something I think a lot of people have looming. Mm -hmm. And I just wish that I had addressed that fear with education. Like knowledge, I think is the number one way not to be fearful. When I went into the birth, I knew so much. I knew so many ways that, you know, the birth could go from listening to the podcast But I also knew that like I had tools in my shed, like I had tools in my pocket for, okay, the doctor wants this, but I'm not sure if I want it, like how to address it. Like Mm -hmm. know your options gave me a lot of different tools to make me feel empowered. So that was helpful. That's so great. Yeah. I mean, the podcast was the inspiration for that because you hear that birth is not always going to go as planned, almost never, right? So We just wanted to prepare everyone for all the different eventualities. And like you mentioned with the other course you took, a lot of times those hospital courses or like you said, taught by nurses, they're just trying to teach you how to be a good patient. Exactly. (laughs) And do what they, you know, what's their norm. And if that's not part of your plan and your wishes, then that's really not helpful. And like, I felt like when I went to the Stork one, I, I feel bad to drag Stork. I'm sure that there are amazing instructors at Stork, but the, my experience was they were sort of just ex- expecting you to all be like birth zombies, like show up, be a little birth zombie, lay down, mm. get what they say, do what they say, and then leave. But with like, you know, so much education with my doula, she and I had been doing workouts together twice a week. I could ask her so many questions. And then knowing like, there are so many different options. There are so many different ways to give birth was like, ugh, I don't know. The birth hour was incredible and the courses just changed the game for me. So I was really thankful for those. And I had a lot of tools in my pocket, just like challenging what was going on, what was told to me and knowing that just because a doctor told me this is what I should do, that doesn't mean that they're in charge. Like ultimately (laughs) they work for you. You're paying them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's your body. And no one has the right to do anything to your body, which um, full circle once we get to delivery, what happens there. Did your partner do any of the modules with you? I wrote down like specific modules. I was like, I really need him to, to watch because he's pretty busy. He's like, I don't know why I need to see all this. But it was so helpful, the ones he watched. Okay. I made sure to have him watch the ones where it came to like what to do while you're in labor, especially like at home while you're in labor when like it would just have been him and me if mm-hmm. I weren't induced. And then just knowing how to treat me and how to like... Coping measures and that kind of thing. Yes, exactly. The coping. Because honestly, like looking back at the birth itself, I don't feel trauma toward the experience. And I honestly think that he felt more trauma toward the experience, Mm. not because he felt any physical pain, but as a partner, like anyone who's in that birth room with you, who is just watching, I think they feel really helpless. Like they don't know what they could possibly do. And like here, the person they love more than anything in the world is just going through the hardest day of, of their life. And like the birth partner is just sort of standing there in a way. Yeah. That's why we always say that doulas often are more helpful to the partner than the person giving birth because they can help them understand what's going on and how to be helpful and not just feel like you said helpless. Exactly. Totally. But you know, no one can replace your partner if you have a partner with you. And in birth, like my doula was incredible. She knew what was going on. She knew how to be my advocate. She was watching out for signs and situations that weren't going to be helpful to me. But when it came to like my husband being there, it was like his hand I wanted to hold. Yeah, It was like his cuddle that made me feel safe. 
it was like the whole team matters, I guess. But mm-hmm. um, I agree. Like, I mean, I could never imagine doing birth without a doula. I think that women were made to help one another through birth. Mm-hmm. Like the whole medical world, like everything's always changing when it comes to like medically how we, we give birth. But throughout time, before hospitals, before needles, before epidurals, before all of it, there were women helping women give birth. So I remember feeling just like an absolute relief having my doula there and being surrounded by her and my mom at my birth. So anyway, that's at 37 weeks. At 38 weeks, they they sent me back, no surprise. And at that point, we were days from Gemini season. Oh my gosh. Days. <laughs> I went to the hospital at May 17th. Oh my gosh. So that was a Tuesday because my blood pressure was really high. And I was like, how is this possible? All I wanted was to just stick it out and I just couldn't make it. But it really was a thing where my doula was like, look it, this is not a joke. Like hypertension is a serious thing. Even though you have your birth preferences, even though you're afraid of induction, because you know that will probably mean that your contractions hurt a little bit more. Like you need to take care of yourself. And I honestly wish I had gone to the hospital sooner for my induction because I still have high blood pressure now. And I'm always wondering if if maybe I had taken the warning of my doctor and doula a little bit more seriously, um, maybe I wouldn't be in this position now. But whatever, it was what it was. It happened the way it happened. I'm at 38 weeks. We go in Tuesday around three o'clock. We're excited. We know we're probably getting induced at this point. We as in my husband and I. Um, And then at around 9 p.m., so after we'd been there for about six hours, the doctor came in and she's like, look, your blood pressure is high and then it's not. Like your baby is okay to be delivered right now and we just can't play games when it comes to high blood pressure. So we are going to induce you. I'm a little wary of this doctor who's on call because... She didn't really give me an option or give me any choices. So right off the bat, I was sort of weary of her. But I was like, yeah, I think you're right. I think that's the way to go. And she wanted to put me on Cytotech to just start ripening my cervix. And I have listened to the birth hour. I'd watched the modules from Know Your Options. So this is when it really came into play. And I was like, oh my God, thank goodness for Know Your Options. I said, I think I need some time to think about it. Would you mind giving me, you know, 20 minutes or so just to digest, you know, what you're saying? And she reluctantly said yes. And when she came back, I let her know that I would rather not have Cytotech. I would prefer Cervidil. And the reason is that I wanted to be able to take my time. Um, Cytotech, to my understanding, works a little bit faster By the time they would have administered the Cytotech, it would have been around like 11 p.m., which means I would have just been like, who knows how quickly I would have gone into labor when they would have broken my water, but likely I wouldn't get a good night's sleep. And I knew that there was a long road ahead and I was already exhausted and worn out. So I opted for Cervidil, which gave me an entire night of somewhat sleep which was ultimately so helpful. And it actually hurt when she put the Cervidil in. I, in my mind, she was mad at me for not listening to what she wanted, but it's like a sharp ribbon. It's really weird. You would think that it'd be softer, but it was scratchy and it hurt so bad. So she's shoving that in me. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is the beginning of so much pain. I'm over here with my birth plan and like these ideals of me not getting an epidural, of me getting through it. Like my mom had four kids without any epidural for any of us. Like I can do it. And she's here she is shoving Cervidil into me. And I'm like, oh my God. So that was the beginning. It was a wake up call for sure. But I got to sleep. They put me in my labor room and I was a little bit upset. I'm not going to lie. I knew from the Know Your Options modules that, you know, we can't walk into the hospital with expectations that everything has to go the dream way. So I I did have like tempered expectations, but I was a little bit bummed that I did have to be induced. It was a bit of a bummer, but I had some friends at that point who sent me these really positive, encouraging messages. Like, even though this isn't your plan, you get to set your room up. Like you get to make 
your birth room exactly the way you want it. I brought flameless candles. I had a diffuser. I had positive things. I had my stuff. I love to unpack when I go to a hotel room. So I like unpacked all my clothes. I made the space mine as much as I could. And I settled in. I had some amazing nurses they took the time to really read through my birth preferences. And I think that was helpful too. Uh, one thing I'll say about the birth preferences is my first part of the one pager was just background on me, anxieties, worries, and ways to communicate with me that are most beneficial. So in my preferences, I shared about my friend who passed away and how I am going to be a little bit more on edge. If there starts to seem like there's an emergency, like that's a place where I could get really, really stressed out quickly. So having a relaxed room, having, you know, really just being really present with what are you saying in front of me? Like, don't like, we can't start overreacting because I've, I could be completely, I just didn't know what I would be. Maybe I'd have a panic attack. Um, they took that really seriously, which was so just amazing. My nurses shared it with one another. When one nurse left her shift, she made sure that the others read my preferences and it was just, it was a really positive experience there. That's so good. Right? Because you hear these terrible stories, but I think it's important to give a little bit of background on who you are. Like people are always going to feel more connected when mm -hmm. they know you. So whether or not you have like a horrific story like mine, or it's, it's just really simple. Like, Hey, you know, I don't like this. I do like that. And here's why. If people understand why you're approaching birth the way you are, it seemed like for me, they were more invested in helping me get there. Yeah. So that was really nice. And then, you know, the next day I wake up, I had breakfast and my cervix had ripened, which was great. Um, I was 80% effaced uh, when I came in, which was a kind of shocking to me. But um, I stayed 80 effaced when I had my check that next day. Um, I think I was two or three centimeters dilated, which was just fine. And by noon the next day, the doctor came and she said, you know, I'd like to break your water and let's get this party started. So we did that. I said, that's totally fine. Let's do it. And um, I made sure to let them know that I wanted a low and slow approach to the Pitocin administration. At that point, they knew that I was aiming for an epidural free birth. And I also had heard from podcasts and everything else that um, Pitocin can sometimes intensify the feeling of contraction. So I definitely wanted low and slow in hopes of just not disrupting my baby as much as possible. So that happened and the water was broken. Broken water felt kind of good, like a little bit of a relief on pressure, which was nice. And the contraction started. Um, I asked my nurse to bring every single birth accessory they had to my room. I was like, fully accessorize me, girlfriend. And so they did. I have like blow up seat. I had the bouncy ball. I had the peanut. Everything was there. So we were trying it all. My doula came and she was super helpful. We just were trying to make sure I moved a lot. They were having a hard time with tracking my contractions. Weirdly, they were, I don't know if they were just trying to pump my tires, but they said that my ab muscles were in the way. It was making it hard for them to see my contractions on the monitor. But at that point, I had gained 60 pounds and I felt like Violet from Willy Wonka, who turned into a, a blueberry. Like, uh-uh. So I just, I just was like, maybe I'm too bloated. So whatever. That was really annoying. They couldn't really read my contractions. But I, I wanted to unplug myself a lot so I could move around and do some squats and put myself in positions to have a favorable birth and to help little Wavy through. So... You know, the contractions weren't that bad at first. I had this beautiful lavender smelling um, diffuser going on that uh, reminded me of this place that I went to when I last time I went to Maui, Hawaii. So I was just envisioning myself at this like beautiful lavender farm in Maui, Hawaii, and breathing through the contractions and trying to stay as relaxed as possible. But as they started to get more intense, I definitely needed more support from my doula and my husband. So they did counter pressure, which at first I was like, I don't know if I like it. But then when they stopped doing counter pressure, I was like, oh my God, yes, I do like it. Please squeeze my hips. I left birth with like bruises on my hips. I needed 
the counter pressure. And we just kept changing positions. I just tried to stay in a positive place. Like so many people, I had a breakdown at like five centimeters or so. I just started sobbing. I was like, I am so tired. I don't know how I'm going to do this. I just felt overcome with all the emotions. There was a time where I felt really grateful for my body and I was so in awe of it during labor at the beginning, like feeling it pushing my baby down, like feeling it work with my baby to help this beautiful little thing come into this world. But then I passed the threshold of this is glorious into the, oh my goodness. Um, And I started wondering, do I need an epidural? Like, do I have what it takes to face this pain? And like, what am I trying to prove to anyone anyway? Um, At that point, we decided that I should get a check. My doula and I had made an agreement that she was going to find out the information on, you know, how dilated I was and how face I was, where the station was. And she would just relay the information that was helpful and useful to me as opposed to giving me numbers because I'd heard so many podcasts where women felt deflated and um, upset when they found out that they weren't as far along as they thought. And as we know from listening to these podcasts and from our courses, just because you are whatever centimeters at one time doesn't mean that like it's not going to be different in 10 minutes. Like it's really just a photograph and so many things can change in a matter of seconds, minutes, hours. So I just didn't want that to creep me out or get me worried or discourage me. At that point, though, I had a new doctor who ended up being the doctor who would be delivering me. Um, He was a little bit more old school. He (laughs) didn't really care about what my doula thought. I don't know if he fully, like, read my birth preferences. He was a little bit less involved and probably not, like, the doctor I would have chose to give my birth, but that was the way it was. So he actually announced what my station was and like what the check told us, even though my doula had told him and the nurse had told him multiple times that like we weren't going to announce it. So funnily enough, I don't even remember, like I didn't even hear him. He was talking to me and I wasn't even responding. I was completely in la la land and I could, I could hear him. I guess not everything he said, but I was in and out of, of lucidness at that point when he came to check me. After the birth, my doula told me was I was at five centimeters. So at that point, I wasn't even in transition. And it was probably around dinner time. So we kept going on. My doula kept on helping me go into different positions. They ordered me sushi at probably 7 or 8 p.m. <laughs> to have after my birth. Like They thought that telling me, I, you're going to have food soon. Like what? It's going to be amazing was going to help me through it. But I was just like, shut up, guys. Like, I'm just trying to make it to my next breath. Like I can't even think about a meal. I was throwing up a lot throughout the birth. So even like it was hard to get to keep anything down, let alone think about a meal. But I know they were trying to help. Um, And then it just started getting really intense. And I hadn't even realized that they were upping my Pitocin this entire time, like the nurses. But we got to this point at around 9 or 10 p.m. around there where my Pitocin was at a level eight. I don't know the units of measure, but we started at two. It goes up to like 14, I think. It was at eight. And eight was too much. That's all I know for sure. Because all of a sudden, I started having 30-minute contractions, which, I mean, I just don't even know how I lived through it. Yeah, I can't imagine that. I don't I don't even... That's like the one thing that's doable with contractions is that they don't last very long. Yeah, and that there's a break, right? Right, yeah. I didn't have that break. It was so Mm. crazy. It was 30 minutes. It was me just breathing through. And before the 30-minute contraction started, I was saying, I think I want an epidural. I was like, F this. I was starting to get a little bit mad. I was like, this can't be real. I don't care anymore. Like I need to just, I can't live through this any longer. And I didn't know how much longer, you know, the birth would be. But um, then the 30 minute contraction started. And at that point I couldn't even ask for an epidural. I couldn't even speak. I was completely 
beside myself in an intense feeling of these contractions. What it meant was that the baby was moving quickly down because my body was just squeezing her out. But I ended up doing squats over the toilet with like a table in front of me in case I needed to lean over. So I did squats for 30 minutes straight. They put me in the bed. I was in like a supported tabletop for my next 30 minute contraction. And then I went back into the bathroom, which ended up being for my next 30 minute contraction. And at that point, my mom shows up. She flew in from Boston to be with me. It's 11 PM. My mom is beautiful. She shows up with her hair curled. She's got makeup on. She's, she's a little ray of sunshine. She prances into my, (laughs) into my room and she's like, hi, Willie. I'm here. Like, don't worry. I'm here. I couldn't even talk to her. I couldn't even make eye contact with her. She did not know what she was walking into. I honestly feel bad for her. I was like, you, oh, poor thing. But she read the room quickly and saw that I was just in a place. Um, that was at 11. I got through that, that next contraction, probably like 1120. They put me back in the bed, um, for a tabletop position. And at this point, I don't remember much. I blacked out at that point in my last 30 minute contraction. And I was just breathing. I went from doing like low moaning breaths, like I was a whale, like, to, I guess at that point I was making the sound as I was exhaling. I might've been hyperventilating myself or something, but I was like, just in a different place. Um, at that point, they started losing the trace of my baby's heart. Like they couldn't like see it. It wasn't showing up well. They thought maybe the, the straps and like the monitors were messed up. Something was off. So all of a sudden, a ton of nurses come in. It got to be a very intense situation. My husband was petrified. My doula was calm. I don't remember any of it because I was out of it completely but they put an oxygen mask over my face and it woke me up. Um, at this point, still no epidural, still going through the pain, still living through it. But the God, the oxygen mask helped so much. Like next time I give birth, I'm going to have the oxygen mask as a tool that I ask for. Um, it helped me so much. So I wake up and when I'm, when I'm awake from this like blacked out state, I just see a ruckus of people in my room. It's like a party. And I'm like, what's going on? Is my baby okay? What's going on? Because it just brings me right back to those fears and those anxieties. Luckily, my nurses knew that. And they said, you know, everything's okay. We're looking for your baby's heart. We're having a hard time tracking it. Um, We just need you to focus on your breath. We need you to stay alert. We need you to relax. So easier said than done when you're going through these really long, really intense contractions. Luckily, once my doula noticed that like A, the contractions were really long and B, my Pitocin was pretty high, she was able to ask the nurses to lower the Pitocin. They listened. It worked out that I started having normal contractions. And at that point, somehow I had no pants on. So I was just in a sports bra, naked almost, and just like in the moment, I'm here on in a tabletop position on my bed and my doula and my husband were switching off, getting on the bed with me while I have no pants on doing the counter pressure. It was crazy. And I only say that because eventually as I'm breathing through, I'm like, oh my God, I have no idea who's behind me at this point giving me counter pressure, but I was just like, I am going to poop on you. I'm going to poop on you. I'm going to poop on you. (laughs) I was freaking out. Like, (laughs) I don't know what to do. Like, please put out a poncho. You are in the splash zone. What is going on here? (laughs) It was really funny. And like, you know, obviously we weren't laughing at the time, but it was funny. And um, the nurses said, no, like that means that your body is getting ready to push, which felt pretty surprising because my last check, um, I was only at a six. I wasn't even in transition the last time that they did a check on me. Of course, they weren't really able to do a check during the two hours of these mega contractions. So they called the doctor in. At that point, I was in transition. He said I was at like an eight. So I wasn't ready to push, he thought. Um, but I'm like, hmm, that's interesting. And within, you know, the next 10 minutes after he left, I was like, look it, I need to push. Like I can feel it. If this isn't me about to poop everywhere, then this baby's coming out. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> so, um, 
I started pushing, uh, you know, they said, if, if that's what you feel, then you need to honor your body. So I was in the supported tabletop position where my, the back of my bed was up. Like if you were trying to sit up in your bed, my arms were there and I was going from like a supported tabletop, like back to a child's pose type thing as I was breathing to just help her move along through me. And that was really helpful. Um, my doula also had trained me in when it comes to pushing. A lot of people say to push like you're pooping. And her whole spiel is that she's the don't push like you're pooping doula. Um, she taught me to sort of hug your core, like your abdominal muscles in, like you're hugging the baby through your belly, um, but to relax your pelvic floor. So not to put that strain in your pelvic floor when it comes to pushing, but instead relax it and center your energy into your core. You know, everyone experiences birth differently. You do what's right for you. That was like our tactic on how I was going to protect my pelvic floor and get through the pushing process. So I pushed, I pushed for like an hour, like so many people have said before, it didn't, it was actually way less painful for me than the contractions. Um, Of course it was painful. Of course you do feel like a ring of fire type feeling, but like at that point, you're relieved. At that point, it's like it's 1 a.m. And all I wanted was for pain to be done and to be over with and to lay down and to have less people looking at my vagina, like literally. So um, I'm pushing and, you know, they start to see the head like pretty soon. And, and, and the nurse and my doula had this shocked moment where they looked at one another and they're like, oh, my God. Like that was fast and they knew that the doctor probably wouldn't believe it. So they're calling the doctor to come in, like this baby's coming out. I have no idea what he was up to, but he was not excited to come over. And um, they had me in this place where like they were trying to have me like stop pushing, which I guess is good. Like it is good to slow down the pushing, even though you want the baby out so badly, but like to slow it down a little bit to like give your, to give your body like time to stretch and to give your your skin like a chance to stretch instead of tear was something that I had planned with my doula. So it was sort of like a give and take where I was like, okay, like I'll, I'll, I'll skip a few pushes, but also where the heck is this guy? And he finally showed up at that point, the baby's head was like going in and out. So they had me flip over to my back, which in retrospect, I wish I had like spoken up and just been like, no, I don't want to do that. I like this position. I like being in tabletop. I don't want to lay down. But I, I was just in a place where I was like, whatever. So I flip over, which takes a lot when you're a literal puppet with 18 different wires and everything attached to you. But we get there. And the nurse told my husband to grab a leg. And he was right there. He saw it all happen. So he had one leg. The a nurse had the other. My doctor, who I wasn't obsessed with, was down there at the helm. And my mom and doula were up top with me. And the baby came out pretty seamlessly. I guess um, it took a f- only a couple of pushes once the doctor was there because she had been in and out for so long. And, um, you know, we heard her cry and it was this magical moment for sure. Like so many people said, um, some point in the pushing, I had taken off my shirt. So I was totally like in the wild, like naked and afraid style birth. Like I put the baby to my chest. I had planned golden hour. And the second she's born, I'm like total mama bear mode. I'm like, please do not cut her cord. I'm like repeating all of my birth preferences. I'm like, please do not wipe off her vernix. Like, please just give her to me. Like we're going to wait. I just was like rattling it off. So they gave me the baby. I'm holding Waverly. She's this little angel. And she has these like she has this like super redness around her eyes and around her mouth. And I guess that was where she like kept on, she was like stalled when we were, when I was birthing her. So she ended up with bruises on her eyes and like above her lip (laughs) from like just where she was paused during birth. And she had a cone head, which my mom was terrified by, but I knew that because I had uh, taken my modules with know your options, that cone head was fine. Like it would, it would be okay. So, um, yeah, so I am holding the baby and the doctor is sort of playing around down there. And I'm just like, what's going on? He's not telling me anything. He starts trying to like help my body birth the placenta. And I'm asking him what's going on. And he just kept telling me, don't worry about it. Pay attention to your baby. And I'm just like, 
what are you talking about? Like, I wanted to know what was going on. I'm fully educated in this process. Like I'm part of it. So I felt my body birthing the placenta. It's not something that you don't feel like you feel it. If you don't have, I mean, I can't speak for like, if you had an epidural or anything, but un, without an epidural, like you can feel your body with the contractions, you can feel your body pushing out the placenta. So I felt that. And I, I felt a little bit ticked that he was just trying to like carry on the process down there without me. And then I'm like, I was very curious about like, am I torn? What's going on down there? And I asked him and he said, uh, a little bit. And I was like, to what degree, how bad is it? What's going on? And he was like, it's not that bad. Just pay attention to your baby, <laughs> which I found so just so frustrating and belittling and paternalistic and irritating. And I was just like, what are you talking about? And I'm, so I keep looking down there and all of a sudden I see him with this huge needle. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are you doing with that needle? Like, please keep me in the loop. And he said, you know, I have to do a couple of stitches on you. Um, so I'm going to numb it. And it wasn't like, is, is this okay? Like whatever. It, he was just telling me what he was doing after I'm begging him to tell me basically. So he gives me the shot, which doesn't feel good, by the way. I'm sure we all know that. Getting a shot in your vagina, not fun. And then he starts to stitch me. The first two stitches, I just felt the pressure of the stitch, which is like pretty normal. But after the second stitch, he puts the needle in me, I guess, to stitch me. And I feel it. Like I fully feel it. I start to scream. I'm like, oh my God, ah, like here I, here I was. And I like lived through the entire birthing process. And by the time this, my baby came out, I had the feeling of this is it. I've reached my pain threshold. I don't want to feel any more pain. Like I don't want to feel any more pain. And here I am getting stitched up and I feel everything. And when I told him that, you know, I can feel that like the numbing didn't work instead of like trying to numb it or help me out or even say, sorry, he just said, we're just going to do this fast. Like, I'm just going to finish it up. Like you only have two more stitches left. Like, <laughs> Is this guy for real? If I told you I was going to do two stitches in your ball sack, would you be like, okay, yeah, just make it quick? Yeah. It was just bizarre. <laughs> and so I was just like, oh my God, <laughs> but he did it. So that was, mm. that was wild. But I still, to this day, don't feel trauma toward birth. And, um, I just felt really supported. I was so thankful for my nurses. I was in shock that I actually got through that without an epidural. I do not think that anyone is better or like a better mom or anything if you choose to have an epidural or not. That was just the right choice for me based on my fears and my my knowledge that I, I wanted to be able to move around and be physical and do squats and do things like that. And I am very like one-on-one -on -one with my body. Like I like to hear what it has to say. So it was the right choice for me, but I never ever, I don't think like no epidural is like the right choice for everyone. And I don't think that anyone's better than another regardless, like however you, you have your baby is the right way to have your baby. That was just the way I did it. And yeah, I felt really proud of myself for getting through it. And, you know, it was just a really magical thing to finally have this baby and it. It didn't feel real until I was holding her, honestly, but this was over. So that's the story. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you're still, like you mentioned at the beginning, you're still kind of in it with postpartum only about a month out. So how has that been? Postpartum has been pretty good. I definitely felt like the brunt of taking care of the baby is on me, which I think a lot of moms probably feel. I'm breastfeeding and breastfeeding is a journey in itself. You just, you start off so tired. Like I had the baby at 1.31 in the morning and I didn't get to go to bed that morning until 5.30. Um, I didn't eat until 5.30 that morning. Like you're just so tired right from the get-go. Um, and you're trying so hard to, to breastfeed and, you know, you have a new nurse and a new nurse has different advice and tells you different things. So at the beginning, it's sort of just like this huge learning curve. You're so in love with your baby. Well, not everyone. I was so in love with my baby and I felt so relieved to be with her. And I was like, I just knew right from the start, like right when I held her that I'm supposed to be a mom. Like I absolutely love this. And however horrific pregnancy was, I just knew that this chapter was going to be better. So I feel good. I'm lucky that my stitches healed really well. 
I did end up getting hemorrhoids, which they suck and no one really talks about it because no one wants to talk about that, but they're really bad. And I wish I had brought my own stool softeners right from the start. I knew to ask for them from my nurses, but the hospital said they like didn't have them and they had to special order them for me or something. So I w- I didn't get stool softeners until like a day later. And I wonder if that affected or if I was just going to get them anyway. But I'm so I'm living through that right now with the hemorrhoids, but those stitches feel healed. Again, I still have high blood pressure. So they ended up putting me on medicine, but it's, it's, you know, under control and the baby's great. She's awesome. Like she's a really good girl. There are some nights where she sleeps well. My husband's really supportive. I was very clear with him that once, you know, the baby was born, I needed him to step it up and take care of me. He did. He had me on this like vitamin regimen to help me lose all the bloating. I was so bloated after birth. Like I felt like three people in one body. But now that I'm officially a month out, I'm like, I don't know, maybe 70% less bloated. I did my first workout a few days ago. It was gentle, but it felt so good to get to move again. And I'm starting to feel like me. I just hated being pregnant so much. And now I'm me again. (laughs) So it feels good. Yeah, that's hard when, especially with fitness being such a big part of your life, to have that taken out is really a struggle mentally as well as physically. Yeah, mentally for sure, Brenda. Such a good point. But now I feel a lot better. Good. All right. Well, you shared some great resources throughout, but anything you want to highlight here at the end? Sure. I would say for people who are worried or have anxiety, one book that helped me right from the get-go was Bringing Up Bebe, which is like the story of a journalist who brings up her children in France. I think that was helpful for me because she says, you know, American moms are very anxious and over worried and like the French moms are a little bit more relaxed typically. So I took that approach. I tried to take that approach as much as I could in pregnancy. And in motherhood, I've been the same way where I'm trying to be more relaxed, which I I feel really good about. I downloaded the Flow app, which I thought was so nice. It tells you like every day, it gives you tips on your pregnancy, helps you track your symptoms. It was just fantastic. It was a fun thing. Like every week it shows you insights on like your baby's growth and development. So I really liked that. Um, Spinning babies was helpful when it came to stretches and being in your body, ways to help you flip the baby. The birth hour, I mean, come on, just binge, binge, binge every episode you can. I found it so helpful. The traumatic stories, the happy stories, the everything in between stories, I just felt like everything was so helpful and it made me feel like I was part of this tribe of amazing women who were able to get through it. If you don't have a doula already and if you can afford one, Doulas are incredible. Mine was life changing. I will, I will never, ever, ever, ever do birth without my doula. I think that like if you're choosing between a doula and having like a fancy crib in your nursery, pick the doula. You know, so I think she was worth every penny. Know your options was a game changer for me though. Those modules really helped me through. So I can't say enough good things about the birth hour and know your options. And I'm just so thankful for you, Brent, oh. for taking the time to to put all of this together for us. I don't think that people say thank you enough for someone like you who, you know, you have a passion for birth stories, but you also make it so we can look back and hopefully have a positive experience and, and feel supported. And I really, I felt supported by strangers all across the country mm-hmm. and knowing their stories. And it's an honor to get to give back and share mine. So thank you, girl. Oh, well, thank you. I'm so glad you were able to come on and share. And I love that the birth hour played some role in your experience. A huge role. (laughs) (laughs) We were, we were best friends and you just didn't know it. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) All right. Well, where can people connect with you? Yeah. I mean, come hang out friends. If anything connected for you, if you felt heard, seen, if you want to vent, um, you can find me on Instagram. My handle there is Lily Scott, L I L L Y S C O T T. Um, on TikTok, I'm more funny and make light of situations. I just posted yesterday my baby having an epic fart. <laughs> so I try to make it just light. On TikTok, my handle is the Lily Scott. 
And it's only that because Lily Scott was taken. Yeah. I don't consider myself a the Lily Scott, <laughs> but you can find me there. And I'm, I'm so excited to connect with whomever would like to. And I just hope whether you reach out or not, that you know that I'm sending every single listener so much love, so much power. Your body's infinitely wise. It was made to do so many hard things. And however your story goes, like I just hope that you feel good about it and, and that you feel supported and know that you know every single woman who's come on to this podcast is sending you support. And you're not alone, even if, even though sometimes you feel just completely alone. So I have to say to that. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Lily, (laughs) for coming on today. Thank you, Bryn. Now I'm going to chat with Megan about Aeroflow Breast Pumps, today's sponsor, and to get your free pump through insurance, as well as other things like maternity compression garments and lactation education and support, head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. All right, let's hear from Megan. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Aeroflow. I'm so excited to talk to you. Hi, Bryn. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we get into our chat about Aeroflow breast pumps? Of course, I have three kids. My oldest is four. She was born in 2017. And then we, um, my middle is two. And then my youngest is brand new. She, he is six weeks old. All right. So tell us about how you discovered Aeroflow breast pumps and uh, why you decided to use them to get your breast pump. Well, so I discovered Aeroflow through your podcast, of course, Good. <laughs> so, which I listened to religiously. <laughs> um, I didn't discover, fortunately, I didn't discover your podcast until I was pregnant with my second. Um, okay. And so I started using it with um, with my second and then also with my third. Um, and with my first, <laughs> I of course, didn't know about Aeroflow. And so I just got the prescription from the doctor and was sent to a medical supply store, had a wait in line, was just given this like brown box. (laughs) I didn't have any choice about which breast pump I was going to get. So I didn't really know any better. So when I found out about Aeroflow, um, I was like, well, it's it's almost seemed too good to be true. (laughs) And uh, (laughs) And uh, it was awesome. So it, it, it was exactly what you said it was going to be. It was pretty incredible. That's really cool. I haven't talked to anybody who has done it without Aeroflow and with. So I'm excited to uh, hear how that was different for you. So um, for those that don't know, can you just kind of explain the process for getting your breast pump uh, for free through Aeroflow breast pumps? Sure. So I logged into the website. I typed in some of my information. I think I needed my um, my insurance information, um, due date, things like that, and then just press submit. And I think honestly, within maybe a day, maybe two days, I heard back via email and they had, they contacted my insurance company and everything. I didn't need to actually even give them a prescription. I think they contacted my midwife. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, they, first they said it was just kind of in process. And then maybe a day or two later, um, I got to access my personal page that had choices of probably a dozen different breast pumps that I had to choose from. Some were free, some were for an upcharge. So it was really cool. And then I could take the time and kind of research which ones I wanted and which ones would best suit what I needed. So it was really incredible versus my first time, which I was just literally just handed a brown box. (laughs) Like, this is what you get. So, so, um, so that was really incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that they contact your care provider for you and your insurance and everything because just the last thing you want to be doing is making another call or figuring out how to fax something to somebody or whatever. So that part was really nice for me and especially that they work with um, midwives as well as, you know, a a doctor's office or something. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know. And I'm not um, savvy with insurance. So is any anybody, yeah. <laughs> they make my, it really hard. Yeah, not my jam. And so I don't even know, honestly know how they, they did it, but they did it, it yeah. again. Like, it, um, there are very few things that I try to give advice about to people who are pregnant, like pregnant ladies. <laughs> we already have too much advice that it's unsolicited advice coming in from people. Yeah. But the two things are always aeroflow and the birth hour. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> I love know. it. Because I don't think some, a lot of the people I've actually told about Aeroflow have never even heard of it. I'm like, this, you guys have to check this out. It sounds too good to be true, but really this is what you should do. 
Yeah. So. Well, I love that. Thanks for spreading the word. <laughs> yeah. Um, what pump did you end up going with for your second? And then did you get a new one for your third? I did. So this is kind of funny. So um, I I was between the Spectra. I used the Medela with the, my first time around. And then um, overwhelmingly advice I got was to get the Spectra. But I ended up with a Luna Motif based on I've, your podcast. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I... I ended up with the Luna motif and I was really happy with that. And then the third time around, um, I actually did the super upcharging at the hands-free one. Um, I think I went with the willow. Okay. Um, so I'm still figuring that one out, <laughs> but I'm only, <laughs> I'm six weeks postpartum. So there's a bit of a learning curve with it. And so, uh, I'll go back to work in, you know, a few months. So I'll hopefully figure it out by then. <laughs> Awesome. That's so funny. I think I have done the exact same path as you. I started with a Medela, and again, it was just handed to me in a brown box. And then uh-huh. I got um, a Spectra with my second, I guess, and then um, the Luna from Motif with my third when that came out. So, oh, um, how funny. Yeah. <laughs> and the Luna was definitely my favorite by far. So, yeah, it was incredible. I know. And it was just funny because, like I said, a lot, because I think the Luna wasn't as well known maybe as the Spectra and the Medela. Right. And so, you know, maybe I think I took it to my Facebook page, like anyone have any recommendations and like overwhelmingly it was the Spectra. And I was like, mm, I'm going to go with the Luna Motif. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> I like, all of the podcasts I listened to, I was like, I'm going to go with Britain's opinion on this one. And I, I was happy with it. So awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience. I really appreciate your time today. All right. All right, Brent, take care. Thanks again to Lily for sharing her birth story with us and to Aeroflow Breast Pumps for sponsoring this episode. Remember to go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get your free breast pump through insurance. And if you're interested in the Know Your Options childbirth course that Lily talked about a lot during her episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com slash course and use the coupon code 100OFF to get $100 off your enrollment. To get other information, including pictures and resources from Lily, head over to thebirthhour.com and search for her name in the search bar to find her show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.